Darian is here today to talk about, and this is one of my favorite titles that we've had, Muddy Waters Steminist Camp, right? Did I get that right? Yep. I'm going to be called, I'm going to call myself a Steminist now. I don't know why I haven't thought of that. That That is phenomenal. So yeah. we can't wait to hear all about it. You can go ahead and take it away. All right. Awesome. Here's what I'll do. I'm going to move y'all over and share my screen here. Okay. All right. So as Jody mentioned, my name is Darian Becker, and I'm currently located in Beloit, Wisconsin. I'm going to be chatting with y'all a little bit today about our Muddy Water Seminist Camp and give you a little bit of a behind the scenes look on what it took to put this camp together. And it's essentially a framework for implementing hydrology protocols from GLOBE in summer programs. So first and foremost, if I ever say I, shame on me, because it was really a group effort and it was from a multitude of different organizations. I'm from the Wilty Environmental Center. I'm the interim program director. And I was working on this camp as an environmental educator. I have since switched roles. And our executive director, Brenda Plackens, our former program director, Aaron Wilson, and our outreach educator at the time, Raven Reginald, were just very important roles to have. And we really couldn't have done this camp also without the staff at Hendricks Career Tech, who are also an education program organization in the city of Beloit. We received our funding, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute, from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. We have an NSF grant in collaboration with Michael Nataro, who is the director of the Center for Climatic Research at UW-Madison. And I just have to give a shout out to all of my guest speakers too. It was a lot of fun just searching for all of these people and learning from them and working alongside them to teach these campers about what it means to be a water scientist because some of these campers came in not knowing that water science was a thing. So that was, that was a really big mind blowing moment for me to just see into, I guess, the viewpoints of all of these kids coming from different areas within the state line area. A lot of our campers came from Illinois, and I think maybe one or two came from the Beloit area or from north of the border of Wisconsin and Illinois. So I guess one of the overarching themes that started this is our pre-existing fifth grade field trip. So we didn't really start from scratch. We had a foundation already established with the school district of Beloit here in Wisconsin. And we do this fifth grade field trip every year for the entire grade level of fifth grade for the school district. And in 2023, the, the reach is absolutely phenomenal. We reached 466 students in 2023 that included not only the fifth graders, but also the high school students who volunteered to help with this field trip, leading the stations or leading the groups. And they actually get class credit for their AP or just regular environmental science course. And last year in 2022, we had 454. So obviously each year is going to fluctuate, but those numbers are pretty amazing. And we're very happy with those. And with that field trip, we have different objectives for curriculum standards and things like that. Primarily, we were comparing biotic and abiotic factors and essentially what the definition of ecology was in the scheme of water science. So we were looking at things like biological indicators, what it means to look at these macroinvertebrates and what they're telling us about the water. But we also primarily focused because of time limitations the water part was only half of the field trip. We also had plot studies in forest and prairie, so we could talk about abiotic and biotic factors in that capacity as well. But the, the water science half of that fifth grade field trip primarily focuses on the chemistry component of water quality. So we rely heavily on Lamont test kits <laughs> just because it's really easy. The logistics are pretty simple. We have the kits already put together for the students to just hit the ground rolling and just plop the tabs in there, shake it, maybe do a couple Fortnite dances or whatever they need to do to get the science done. And we primarily look at the indicators such as dissolved oxygen, as well as nitrates, phosphates, turbidity, and pH. 
And it kind of goes along really well with what Globe is already establishing with their information that they're wanting to do. And we did a similar sort of one-off program with Hendrix Career Tech in 2022, where we just had a one-day event with the students and we were able to take them to two different sites around the city of Beloit. We are really blessed with the opportunity to have so many water bodies <laughs> just a stone's throw away. We have the Rock River, we have Turtle Creek and a few other unnamed or less known tributaries of the Rock River that we are able to explore. So we went to Sweet Allen Park in Beloit, and then there is a small unnamed tributary of the Rock River in Big Hill Park. So it was really easy for us to access. But that one day event was primarily broken down into three different parts, similar to our fifth grade field trip. We obviously let the kids go into the water to find anything they possibly could. We found a lot of tadpoles. The lucky kids who were really fast got to find some fish. And we were just able to get a bunch of tubs out on the shoreline and show kids what on earth is in this water. And it was a lot of fun. With all of the information that we collected with the living critters, we were able to determine some sort of quantifying factor of whether this water is poor or great or something along those lines. And we did that using their bioindicator statuses, whether they were semi-sensitive to pollution or completely tolerant like our leeches and bloodworms and critters like that. But kind of finishing that narrative of water quality, we were able to also do some chemistry, just like our fifth grade field trip. And we were able to compare the two different sites. And Goose Creek, unfortunately, is notoriously known for its poor water quality. So we were able to compare Sweet Allen Park, which is pretty well known for its fishing, canoeing, and kayaking, and things like that. And there is a park right next to the river. So we were able to look at things like that with houses right up against the stream, like how does things like fertilizer or how you treat your lawns or something along those lines affecting those, but the water quality was a little bit better. So we were able to compare those different abiotic factors. And this day went so incredibly well. It was almost immediately after this trip was done, we were like, we have to do something more. We need to figure out how we can structure this into maybe a three or five day long camp. So that's what we were able to do <laughs> with, with the help of Michael Nataro at UW-Madison, we were able to get some additional funding from a pre-existing grant that we received in 2021, where the parent grant is ultimately looking at how we can implement GLOBE and fostering STEM using GLOBE protocols in the diverse Wisconsin community. So this overarching, grant allows us to do these sorts of camps. We're also able to foster a relationship with our high school interns, two of whom last spring received awards at the Midwest Student Research Symposium, which was absolutely amazing. They were super proud of their work, and of course I was too. But along with that, we were able to receive a supplement in 2023 where we're able to not only empower all diverse communities in the state line region of Wisconsin, but we were able to focus a little bit closer in, in women in STEM and young girls in STEM and how we can foster that, that passion, that interest, that intrigue, curiosity in water science, because obviously some of these kids didn't even know water science was a thing you can study, which is why we need more of these camps. But specifically, one of the goals of this supplement grant is to develop the Welty Science Camp, which ended up being Muddy Water Steminist Camp for middle and high school age girls to, excuse me, to empower the next generation of female scientists. So when I started, putting everything together. I started with a blank sheet on Google Docs and I said, how on earth am I going to start this? Obviously I had feedback from other people, but I really wanted it to be kind of a building block, you know, having a foundation to start with, starting with the very basics. Like what on earth is water science? Like how can we study water? Water is just this thing that exists, but there is so much more involved that we can learn, that we can explore, that we can ask more questions and do more research and explore more. So the goal was to continue building up in complexity. So on day five, when these students were going off and finishing out their summers, some of them were 
in and out and doing other things like birthday parties or what have you. But when they finished, they had a certificate in their hand saying they spent 30 hours with Wealthy Environmental Center, with this Muddy Water Stimulus Camp, and they have the tools, they have the information so they can share this information with people. And ultimately, we want these informed students going out into their communities and making a difference. So that was one of the overarching goals. And we were dealing with uh, dealing with different topics, such as what is a wetland and how are water bodies kind of treating themselves because there are natural processes that we need to know about. And what are the main causes for water pollution? How can we as people kind of join in the narrative of water science and try to improve the systems that we maybe know are poor and we want to improve them or learning about really well established conditions of sources and learning about what maybe we could do better from the other places. And then just figuring out who is impacted by water quality. Maybe we are and we just don't realize it or there are plants and animals that we need to consider as well. To kind of quantify how our camp went, because obviously this is a flagship camp, we had a little bit of data just from people telling us how things went, but we wanted to be able to put numbers to things and try to compare how the students reflected different topics, whether it's information retention or identity, because that was one of the things that I really wanted to target. I wanted the students to know that they are considered STEM scientists. I wanted them to, to take hold of that identity to say, I don't need a science degree in order to do science. That's the definition of citizen science. So we gave this survey to the campers before in the very beginning saying, hello, welcome to camp, fill out this survey, just so we could get a little bit of their perceptions, their prior knowledge and other things that they maybe would have gotten from school or from home or from their communities. And we got a little bit of demographic data as well, such as age, maybe what grade they just finished, because like I said before, our goal was middle and high school, but you know how ages and grades sometimes don't line up exactly. The math is very convoluted and confusing, but we just wanted to get a little bit of data and figuring out maybe what schools they were coming from, because if they were coming from somewhere in Illinois, I don't know much about the schools in Illinois, what their classrooms are teaching, what field trips they take and other things like that. So just being able to compare apples to apples. And with the guest speakers, this was one of my most favorite parts. So a lot of these wonderful people were actually people who I had already met from previous engagements, whether it was people who are on the grant with us from UW-Madison through Beloit College, people who I already had lined up as guest speakers for my other summer camp. And I said, hey, we have this other thing that I bet you would be a great fit for. And if any of you went to the Midwest SRS back in April of this year, this person in the middle, Lizzie Emsch, they actually are a graduate student at the Center for Limnology where we did our tour in back in April of this year. And it was really cool. I was able to connect with them and they had a really great energy and they loved all of the information they were giving and they just wanted to get kids, you know, looking at microscopes, looking at the copepods and all that fun stuff. So I just had to invite them out and it was a blast. But my ultimate goal for inviting these people is I wanted to identify guest speakers who specialized in some form of water science. And like any kind of science, you can look at it in a bunch of different ways. You can try to find some sort of relationship to water science. And along with that, I wanted to find some people who studied problems that are relevant to us, like human health or indigenous knowledge or other things like that as well as representing different sectors and career stages. So it was a wonderful time and I ended up finding a wonderful panel of people studying things as near and wide as ecotoxicology to studying community science and more of the soft science, which is ended up being really important for the students to hear from, not just having a 
big scary scientist in front of them but having somebody who they could just talk to like who seems like a more regular person which we were trying to break those barriers obviously that was one of the goals but people like Stephanie Schmidt from the International Crane Foundation in Madison was able to bring her interest in crane ecology talking about the importance of wetlands because cranes depend on them for their livelihood throughout the year and we had Dr. Elizabeth Harahy from UW Whitewater come and talk about her work with blue green algae. So bringing in that human health component and talking about ecotoxicology and talking about how frogs or fish and other things are being affected by the pollutants that are going into the water. And Lizzie was able to bring a lot of really cool stuff about their saltwater dynamics in Lake Monona. And it it was it was all just really wonderful. I feel like I learned more in a week than I had in a very long time. With the development of activities, I took a lot of information from curricula like Project WET, as well as the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, and kind of tweaked a bunch of pre-existing things that were online. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. But some of the really fun highlights that I really enjoyed seeing come to fruition were things like ephemeral wetland delineation. Like what? <laughs> but we had an ephemeral, we have an ephemeral wetland at the very front of our center. And we were able to try and define a wetland. Like what does it take to be a wetland? Usually kids say it has to be wet but here's an ephemeral wetland that is functioning as a wetland without any water, what's going on there? So we were able to take soil samples with augers, we looked for insects, we did a little bit of field soil testing to look at how the soil differed as you went uphill, and we did a little bit of, we did a little bit of wetland delineation, and it was a lot of fun. We also tried, and it kind of ended up royally failing, but it was a lot of fun in the process, but I found this activity online where you could do Lego bathymetry, which is just looking at how a, a pond or a lake changes in elevation at the bottom, just being able to see how the bottom affects things like water temperature or making little microclimates or something along those lines in the water. So we did that with Legos. And we learned very quickly that aluminum foil does not hold water very well, hence the towel underneath the structure that they were making. But we were essentially trying to simulate the idea of wetland engineering and how wetlands can be created by people and how depending on the goals of the project, you might need to make a wetland a certain size to be able to hold a certain amount of water. So they were able to measure with a ruler the dimensions of their, you know, their wetland essentially, or their pond made out of Legos. So they could estimate the volume of water that the pond would theoretically hold. Obviously it didn't because as soon as you added a hundred milliliters, it ended up on the table. So it's, it's all about learning. It's, it's all about not being afraid to make mistakes. But then we did some other fun activities like cereal dichotomy. And then the insect soil sorting was related to the wetland delineation. But a lot of other activities that some of them are things that I completely made up, like stream order war, it ended up being Skippo, just being modified to talk about how stream orders continually increase as you go further downstream. And we also found a fox snake. So it's all about learning opportunities, kind of finding us, which was a lot of fun. And then things like turtle tag and our Enviroscape we were able to use for learning about wetlands and things that depend on wetlands. All right, so with GLOBE, when it came to all of the data entry, we allowed for at least 30 minutes at the end of every day, whether we had a field trip or not, to get caught up on GLOBE data entry. And we used resources like macroinvertebrates.org to try and identify our critters. We also had other field guides like Pond Life or just Googling things or just knowing from experience and other things like that. But we were able to measure a lot of different things, whether it's biotic or abiotic about our sites. We did use measuring tape and we measured the channel, especially if it was a massive confluence of the turtle of Turtle Creek and the Rock River. It was a lot of fun just having the kids lug this tape halfway across the stream and hopefully not 
trip and fall, but it ended up being a lot of fun. We didn't lose any children that day. It was great. But there were other components in addition to the GLOBE protocols like nitrates and dissolved oxygen and turbidity that weren't necessarily asked for, but we made sure to include those in the details, extra additional information or what have you. We did do phosphate testing similar to our fifth grade field trip. So we had the Lamont test. So we said, why not just do it all? And we also, on the first day, we did a fecal coliform test. It ended up being positive. How sad. But because of the time that it took for the test to process, we needed to only do it on the first day. So we were kind of limited with time on that. But at least the kids were able to see the physical change of the test samples so they knew it was either positive or negative result. And I always, when I enter data into GLOBE, whether I'm working with second graders or eighth graders, I ask them if they had fun collecting the data. And usually it's a yes, but then we have a couple no's sprinkled in there because they were too cold or they got too wet or something along those lines. But I like to add that information because I feel like NASA needs to know that these kids are having fun doing the data collection. And these are some of the highlight critters that we found. I still to this day do not know what this little critter is. So if anybody knows, y'all can let me know. <laughs> but we found a lot of really cool tadpoles and crayfish. The crayfish were a hoot and a half. The kids were screaming, running down the stream as fast as you can go, running through water, which isn't very fast. But they had a lot of fun finding the crayfish. They just had them in hand and they just kept catching them and bringing them out. And it was just a lot of fun. And this is just an example of the poster that we use. This might be a resource from the Wisconsin DNR. I'm not entirely sure. It's It's been at the center for so long. I don't know where the, where the parent source is, but this was from Sweet Allen Park. So we were just able to do, essentially it was just figuring out if we had a critter present in any of our tubs. We just checked it and said, yup, it's there. And we were able to determine based on how many individual classes or species of each group, we were able to calculate the health of the stream, which was a lot of fun. And the kids were, they, they kind of stayed on task when it came to the math. We did our best. <laughs> and then at the end, they got a certification and it's something great that they can take home that they can hold in their hands and say, wow, I did it. And I feel like that was a really important component that I wanted to include in this camp. So, you know, all of the people involved with the camp signed it and they just finished it off and said, yeah, we did it. It's it's great. They did 30 hours at the Welty Center, which is just mind bogglingly cool. So this is where the hard numbers come in. And I feel like this is really important, but I do have a few highlights. So some of the questions that we included, just as a reminder, they're the 10 questions that we asked. And some of the results that I find interesting, for instance, is the ones. So you may notice that, I mean, obviously we would expect that between pre-camp and post-camp responses, the numbers would increase. That's our goal, right? They'll become more informed. They'll feel more confident in the information that they were given. And we had one camper who left after day one and only put ones for all of her responses, except for one question where she put a two. So I, I, I think there was a little miscommunication as to what the expectation was for the camp. So maybe that's what ended up happening. And they just left after day one because it wasn't what they expected. And then what I find interesting here is the, the one camper who gave a one for the post-camp response was actually different, obviously, because the person who put all ones was gone. So somebody went from a two to a one over the course of the five days, which I'm thinking, oh no, what did we do wrong? Like, where's that disconnect? But moving on from that, we had question four, which is, I know the watershed in which I live. And we hammered it home. We said, we are in the Rock River watershed, defining what a watershed is. What does that mean in the grand scheme of things? And it's really good that we were able to find that more campers understood what a watershed was and where they were located. And it's really interesting in that the Rock River watershed goes all the way up into Wisconsin and down through Illinois to the Iowa border where the Rock River meets the Mississippi River. So regardless of whether you're in Illinois or Wisconsin, the water doesn't care. It, it crosses state boundaries and it doesn't matter. So 
that was very encouraging for me. But interestingly, I found a relationship that, I mean, I'll talk about that in a second. But the last two questions, and really the first question, we're talking about identity and where they see themselves in the greater picture of water science. And I believe jobs in STEM are important, and I want to pursue STEM as a career, both increased, and I mean, it's a scale of one to five, so increasing dramatically would mean between two to four or something along those lines. But I was very happy to see that things were kind of shrinking up toward the top near four and five. So these campers, after all of this experience throughout the week, they were able to interact with guest speakers. They were able to work together and solve these problems and figuring out water quality of these different places, which is fantastic. And that's my goal. That's what I wanted. But then there's there's this whole figure of seeing myself as a scientist and wanting to pursue STEM as a career. And Intellectually speaking, just thinking of the phrases, you would expect that they would be somewhat related. And with the small sample size that we had, I mean, the R square value, 32.9% accuracy isn't super great, but taking into account that there were only seven students by the end of the camp, I mean, you only get what you have. So working with what you have is all we have. So take that with a grain of salt, if you will. But I'm very interested to see how next year's data pans out to see if that relationship is still there. And I mean, I'm very glad that these numbers have improved, especially for that seeing myself as a scientist question. But then there was that one person who said a one and I'm just like, what do you do? What can I do for you to show you that water science is for everyone? But ultimately the takeaways are well we're learning a lot because like i said this camp is new for all of us hendrix career tech was incredibly helpful with things like logistics and getting us from point a to point b and that was one of the rooms for improvement is we really wanted to get more campers and there were campers who were very interested or at least the parents who signed them up were very interested in their camper coming to camp but because of transportation limitations, we were only able to have a cap of 10 campers. So we're hoping with planning logistics for the next year's camp, we're trying to figure out ways in which we can encourage registration because there were a lot of campers who flaked out after the first day or two, but they didn't say anything. The wait list was left to sit and we just found a disconnect there, but we're working on that. And another one of the things that I found very interesting and I guess unsurprising is the campers really resonated with the younger professionals. So someone like Lizzie, who's in graduate school, and they have this great upbeat personality and just talking with the campers like their fellow friends or what have you, the campers really really eat up that energy and they were just so smitten by these younger professionals and it's just really interesting to maybe see how we should shape our guest speakers next year and next year's camp is likely going to be three days so we need to figure out how to condense everything into three days but that's that's for a future discussion. But some of the other things that we noted were that schedule flexibility was so incredibly critical. During this time, the Canada wildfires were running rampant. The air quality index was in the 240s. We had some campers who had to stay indoors because they were having asthma irritations and things like that. So we just had to be flexible. It's it's with any camp, any program with students. We just have to be prepared for, I guess, the inevitables or what have you. So let's see. So one room for improvement that I was attempting to address, but I found it very challenging is that all of my guest speakers were white, while 43%, almost half, talking about four out of, or three out of seven campers by the end of the week, were Black, Indigenous, or person of color. So it makes me wonder if there is a little disconnect there with the campers because they aren't being represented, or they aren't seeing people like them with this small panel of people who I chose for the week. It was one guest speaker per day, 
And just thinking about that and who I should maybe try to identify as a guest speaker for next year. And obviously things like logistics, great, we were able to transport all of the campers, but we found that visiting two sites in one day really burnt them out. And by the end, they just wanted to play in the water. And I mean, who can really blame them? It's a really nice late June day. We ended up having the camp from June 26th to June 30th last year, or I guess this past summer. And yeah, it ended up it ended up being an overall really great camp. And like I mentioned, we do plan on having another camp in 2024 with it being three days instead of five. So that is really all the information I have. If anybody has any questions, I am more than happy to share a little more insight if you need any clarifications or anything. And I'm always looking for people who are interested in implementing camps like this. We, I mean, like I said, we're learning. So it's it's all a learning process here, but I'm very happy to share the information that I have learned in this. Uh, Darian, David just shared in the chat a speaker. If David, if you want to say anything more about this person as a possible speaker, that'd be great. Uh, it's uh, Dr. Carolyn Finney, a uh, good friend of mine. I mean, she'd probably uh, not be happy with me if I described her as not being uh, young and high energy. But she, um, <laughs> she <laughs> but she's great. I mean, she's really. Um, I, I, you just look at her webpage and her book. I mean, she's very. Um, you know, at her whole um, mission is getting you know, specifically African-Americans, but people of color are more in tune with the outdoors, the environment. Uh, and her research is all about, you know, some of the barriers to, to you know, why people of color might not be inclined to just be outside. And, and she is a geographer and um, you know, she's great. I mean, I, that's all I can say. It's, that's it's, super. Thank it's, you. It's, 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 yeah. That's I'm gonna, great. I'm gonna unshare my screen here. Other questions or comments? Of course, um, I yeah, go ahead, Susan. I'll uh, put it in the chat, but um, the Natural Inquirer, who we've been doing some joint stuff with you guys, um, we have a freshwater edition, and um, we also have our scientist cards, which um, might help you with kind of a little more seeing if you have trouble getting um, people of color or, you know, other representation it live, um, the scientist cards might help you with that because um, there's a whole bunch of folks in there. Awesome. Um, and, and I noticed in the freshwater edition that um, one of the scientists is Asian and one of the scientists is African-American. So, um, you know, there's that mix there, but I'll put the link to that freshwater. That's something that you can order something um, order for each of your students. It's all free. Oh, wow. um, and uh, the scientist cards as well. It's just something we do for the good of the order. <laughs> That's so wonderful. Thank you. It's fantastic. Um, other questions or comments? Oh, that's, that's really nice. Thank you, Susan. That's a great resource. Uh, other questions or comments from anybody? Well, I, I have two, <laughs> two, two things to, to talk about. Um, on your survey, you had 10 questions. They were a really nice set. Could you share that survey with us? Sure. With that? So you can either, you know, if you have a link, you can, or if you want to um, uh, email it to me, or I can put my email in there, and then we can get it out to everybody. Yeah. Um, I thought that was really great for 10 questions. I'm a survey researcher, or was. <laughs> I haven't done a whole lot recently. Um, and those were really 10 nice questions because, you know, if you, if you really want it to be a short survey, you have to really pick your questions carefully. Yeah. Um, and I'll yeah. tell you right now, I, it was very last minute that we were thinking, man, why didn't we think of this sooner? We need to find a way to quantify how successful this camp is. And usually we work with seven to 12 year olds, so they don't really have the bandwidth to do a survey, but 
with with these older kids with the average being around 12 years old you know they can they can fill out a survey for five minutes so i just threw together some questions and it ended up working out really well and i'm i'm just hoping that over the years we're able to get a good data set so these questions we can actually find some trends and improve our camp with that feedback yeah. And I, and I might suggest adding one question and something on self-efficacy. Janet's probably going to laugh because she knows that's my, <laughs> that's what we, uh, University of Toledo, Bowling Green, that's it's kind of what we do. Um, but uh, self-efficacy is a really good predictor. I mean, sometimes they don't see themselves becoming a science um, scientist yet or a water scientist, right? That's too far. It's like hard to get there, especially in five days. But you might get them to say, I have what it takes to be successful at doing water science. And that's an efficacy question. Mm -hmm. And I might say, I have what it takes in terms of knowledge and skills or something like that. Because if you can move their efficacy, that's a good indicator that you've got them thinking about it, right? Because that's yeah. got to happen like, you know, it's, again, one of the best predictors of, of future um, behaviors and actions. And even though this is down the road for them, if, they, if they've gained some self-efficacy, um, I think that that's a really good uh, thing for you. I mean, you should feel really good if they see themselves become, having what it takes to be a, a water scientist. I think Absolutely. That'd be really good. That's beautifully said, Jody. Thank you. Um, and the other question I had is about the Lamont kits that you use. Mm -hmm. Sorry, those are my dogs. <laughs> I have no idea what's happening. Um, anyway, uh, those kits, I know with younger learners, they're great because like what you said, they're affordable. You drop the tab in, you shake it up. And I noticed that you actually had readings before I used to see those Lamont kits that they were kind of like low, medium, high as far as the scale, but you actually got to parts per million or something, it seems as if, right? Yeah, so they have a color code system where, for instance, with, and I can't think of an example, oh, pH. pH is really easy because the color changes in like 30 seconds, which is really great. And we made sure to switch who did what test because the kids doing pH, they're like, yeah, one and done, we're good. <laughs> but with the nitrates, you have to wait like seven minutes. But um, yeah, we, we had little sheets that came with our kits. And for instance, with pH, it had different color squares to indicate the pH value that the water sample had. So yeah, we were able to quantify it a little bit more into not to the nearest tenth or anything crazy, but you know, if you think it's between blue, green, and green, blue, then call it seven and a half. Why not? You know, you don't want to make it too convoluted for them. But yeah, it it made for a really good snapshot, which we made sure to focus too, saying, you know, if we came back tomorrow, the numbers might be different, especially if we had precipitation recently or something along right. those lines. Sure. And talking about more, you know, temporal sort of relationships there. Yeah. So I guess my question or my, um, you know, what I maybe thought we could all discuss is, has have others used those kits? And I know that within the globe system, you kind of have to use the Lamont where you get to the 10th, I think anyway that you do, but maybe I'm wrong on that. Um, in my mind that this is a big deal because I think some people don't do hydrology because they don't either A, can't afford those Lamont kits or they're sat on the shelf too long and they're no longer, um, you know, reliable. Um, so has anybody else used those other kits? I think this might be something we should talk about as a larger globe community at some point. Um, we've used Lamont, but not the kits she showed in the presentation. So I I wrote myself a note to go check those kits out. Yeah. And I'll tell you right now that I think is the same type of kit that we use, but I'm not 100% positive. I think so. But it just ends up being the test tabs. So I think I Googled Lamont test tabs, found their website. Oh, I see. I see. Oh, yeah. the picture. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Nothing too crazy or out of the ordinary. Yeah. I think that was just like a collection of all of their tests that they do. Right. And they made it all nice and pretty for people to say, ooh, ah, let's buy Lamont. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I know that um, I used to teach an undergraduate course at Bowling Green and we did hydrology and it would take me oh, uh, like uh, two or three class sessions before students actually were good enough at, at water testing to, 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 to do it well with the with the other Lamont kits where you're it's using you know some of the more advanced protocols and 
chemicals and so forth. Mm -hmm. So I, I just really love the fact that you use those. And I think it's very appropriate for the students that you were working with. And I'm just wondering, I think that's something that I know we're having conversations uh, with the Globe Scientist team about expanding access to uh, by looking at some other test kits and equipment materials. But I didn't know if anybody else had heard any conversations around that. We've we moved away from Lamont kits only because of the challenges we were having, you know, for there's a, a, a districts uh, you can in a science supply company, right? You can buy those kits. And if you buy them somewhat in bulk, right, they did they had a better price. But yeah. the problem is if they sit on a shelf, then it, it was a real problem because we would I mean, teachers had brand new, like open the box kinds of things, but we got terrible results because they'd been sitting mm. you know, in a cabinet for two years or whatever, right? The the chemicals. So we, we've we ended up, most of our hydrology now is for using uh, probeware to be able mm. to do it, right? Mm. Because you're, the, the upfront cost is significantly more, but we don't have, we, we know we're in a in a better, better spot I think. yeah 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 we, yeah we kind of have the cool opportunity that we just go through our test tabs so quickly so we don't have to worry about shelf life necessarily because we have we have how many groups and we have two rotations with maybe two or we have yeah we have we go through two sets of tabs essentially every day because we have two rotations with however many kids. So it ends up working out really well that our tabs just go so quickly. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Yeah, this was all school-based, right? So the opportunity to get them to a, a body of water to be able to monitor, right, is pretty, the window is pretty narrow, right? And then, you know, we get yeah. a little, little, little time in the spring, a little time in the fall, mm -hmm. right? So if you don't burn through the materials, you're now you're a year out, right? From right. Yeah. We do our fifth grade field trips in May. So we just hike down the hill, hike back up and we call it a day and we do two field trips every day for almost the entire month of May. So that's great. Yeah. yeah. The kids that I was talking about, I'm going to share my screen if that's okay, real quick. It's they look more like this. Do you see the Lamont kit there now? Mm, mm -hmm. And these are the ones that I think I, I maybe those are the ones you're talking about too, Mike. They're right. very expensive. Number one, well, seventy three dollars. And then if you get the refill pack, I don't even remember what that is. The second problem is is that some of these chemicals you have to you can't just throw down the drain. You have to take out a, a another jug with you, put the chemicals in there, and then get them to a lab that will actually accept them and dispose of them properly. Um, so I really like the, the tabs that you're using and I like the probes. And so I really think that maybe as we uh, move on and glow, we should we should have some conversations around this, because I know that that this is what keeps some people from doing hydrology, because these things are just problematic for all the reasons we've identified. Um, and while I have you here, I might as well show you a little little something we're working on with the U.S. office right now. Um, this is just an idea that just came about. We're, we're coming up with a globe list uh, uh, in Amazon. If you're, you know, I hate to say Amazon, but it is what it is. And so we're going to have the globe program kind of list when, and, and finding the materials that are globe um, equipment and supplies and having them in this globe list. And so this is just an idea. We're just playing with it right now. And at some point in time, we may be reaching out to you saying, hey, is there some other things you'd like to add to the globe list? And that way we can help people when they're trying to find materials. And if they do shop on Amazon, they could go to this list, search it and find what they're looking for. So um, I think that's a great idea. I think um, so. we use we copy, you know, we have our sheets of in, in Excel with the links and stuff um, for Amazon. And the only reason we bought from Amazon is because I forget, maybe probably at least four or five years, University of Toledo had an Amazon account. They don't want you buying any from anywhere else. If you can't That's find it on Amazon, you're going to have to justify sometimes why you chose another site. 
Um, yeah, that's what I'm hearing from schools is that they're saying that that's now the preferred vendor and that that's what they want them all to be using. So, so we thought we'd put a little list together and that's just, we're just at the beginning of it, playing around with it, but we'll. Uh... For new people in Globe, that will really help because they're always um, asking, well, is this okay? Um, I don't remember, you know, what company this probe was or whatever. And if you have a list, uh, the new people, the globe can go right there and uh, get started. Yep, that's what we're hoping for. I will say I'm one of those people who's emailing Michael Nataro and he ends up forwarding my emails to either Kevin Chikowski or you. Yeah. <laughs> so. That's great. Um, well, any other questions, Darian, that your program it just sounds really great. And I, I, you could just see the girls just having a, a, a blast sitting in the water, sitting in the street, which is what we want, right? We want to see kids really engaging and interacting with the environment. So those, those pictures are uh, really powerful. Um, but any other questions or comments for Darian uh, before we sign off? Just that I, I put in the chat um, the link to Manners, the Minorities in Agriculture, Natural Resources, and Related Sciences for potential scientists you might be able to connect with. Oh, that's great, too. It's that's wonderful. Really good. Hoping to find local people in Wisconsin. We do have an honorarium or some sort of reimbursement for them that we're trying to work together the details for. But yeah, in person is ideal. Obviously, if we find a really awesome person who has a great energy, we could always zoom them in or something like that. Been playing around with that idea in my brain over the last few weeks or so. But yeah, definitely. Don't, yeah, don't forget, you know, NRCS is all about water <laughs> most <laughs> respect so you might be able to find out you know find somebody local um you know through them as well but um yeah yeah that's great i actually screen captured your uh slide with your speakers because i was thinking for the srs this year janet in toledo maybe we'll pull in a speaker from wisconsin since you're coming anyway so i thought oh that could be cool and whether it be face to face or if we zoom, we'll zoom with somebody but yeah. uh, so uh, I'll be, I might reach out to you, Darian, and ask for so, yeah, I can put some speakers. In people's ears. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Super. All right. Um, well, I think that uh, if, if we don't have any other questions, I think we just take our eight minutes and have it back to our, uh, whatever it is that you're going to do this evening. And uh, let's just have a round of applause for Darian. Thank you very much for sharing. And uh, I wish you all a very happy holiday.